All right, we'll get going. So first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for tonight's um, webinar. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I'm Susie Killing, and I'm the Science Manager at b lamb New Zealand. And what we're going to do for you tonight is to give you an update, um, not only on our wider facial eczema program, but more specifically on the work um, that Axel's been leading for us on the facial eczema uh, tolerance test. Um, so in terms of some housekeeping, um, more than encourage you to keep your cameras on. Um, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. So I do encourage you to post your questions either through the Q&A, um, um, I guess it's a box or um, chat down the bottom and we'll be collating them as we go through giving you an update on the various projects that we've been working on. Um, and if there's any hiccups or anything's going wrong, just please put a message in the chat and we'll see if we can help you in the background. And we'll now make a start. Hopefully slides will cooperate. Um, in terms of timing for tonight, um, we've got about um, 20 to 30 minutes um, worth of presentation for you. Uh, but then we really want to keep the focus on um, a good discussion at the end. And we're certainly aiming to wrap up um, by 7.30 because conscious of people might be wanting to have dinner and put their feet up for the evening. So in terms of what to expect tonight, I'll give you an overview of the Eliminating Facial Eczema Impacts Program. Um, I'll then hand over to Cara to talk about the achievements so far. And then Axel will give you an overview of the Facial Eczema Tolerance Test for sheep. And then John will be talking to you about how that's transitioning to a commercial diagnostic test and the progress that we're making there. And then we'll have a session towards the end, which is very much focused on Q&A. And if we don't have the answer for you, um, then we'll certainly go away and find it out because um, we don't know everything. We're still very much in the discovery process, um, but hopefully what we present tonight gives you a bit of an insight as to the work that we've been doing for the last few years. And so just so that we're all on the same page, um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with facial eczema, so facial eczema is associated with a fungus. Um, Pseudopithomyces, um, which is which produces a toxin known as sporodesmin. So this particular um, toxin um, can result in significant liver damage. And then you can see on the, um, I think it'll be your right hand side there, uh, the images of animals that have been clinically affected with facial eczema. So there's various progressions of the disease. So there can also be subclinical effects well before you see any of the, I guess, what's described as photosensitization or the sunburn that's observed in those animals there. So that could be, um, you know, reduced uh, fertility, lower, product lower product productivity, um, reduced weight gain. So there are a number of things that you would see well before the disease manifests in its clinical um, perspective. And when we have been working on this, um, as far as developing a research program, one of the things that became really apparent was that we need new solutions. You know, we need to tackle this from very different perspectives um, to what's been done in the past. Uh, a lot of the knowledge um, about facial eczema is quite old and outdated. So we've got the opportunity with some of the new science that is now available to tackle it from different perspectives and look at some of those different technologies. I've already mentioned the significant impacts on productivity. Um, it's painful and untreatable. There's no cure currently for facial eczema. And it's also um, indiscriminate in that it affects most ruminant species. So sheep, cattle, deer, llama. Um, we also know that it's um, a disease that really impacts um, farmer wellbeing. You know, the stories that farmers have told us about, you know, their experiences of facial eczema have been nothing short of horrific. So we know that that is a really key aspect that we need to be considering of with any of the research that we're doing. Um, the fungus that's associated with um, facial eczema um, is spreading. Historically, it's been primarily thought of as a disease of the, the North Island, but we're certainly seeing it start to become an issue in the South Island as well. There's also some market risks associated with how animals are selected um, for FE tolerance. So that's something that we'll talk a little bit more about tonight is one of the reasons why we're looking to develop this new test for selecting for FE tolerant animals. And also it has a significant economic impact. Um, our economic service team did some modeling for us and we estimate about $332 million per annum in terms of its impact on sheep, beef and deer. So it's quite significant um, in terms of its overall impacts. 
So this really drives the, the need for new solutions moving forward. And when we think about our facial eczema research areas, we're always thinking about them from the perspective of farmers, animals, and the environment. So we're never thinking about anything in isolation. So we're always working towards having a whole farm systems approach. Now, in terms of um, what our bigger program of look, that, that looks like, um, hopefully some of you were aware of the announcement a few months ago that we were successful in securing um, government co-funding through the MPI SFFF program. And Beef and Lamb is also contributing a substantial amount of money. So this is a, a significant seven-year investment, $20.7 million, and we've got at least 13 in-kind contributors and at least uh, 350 farmers are expected to be directly involved. And, you know, whilst Beef and Lamb is proud and honoured to be leading this, we certainly recognise that it's not something that we can go alone. And whilst I'm not going to go through, um, you know, all of the organisations listed on the slide in front of you now, hopefully it gives you a sense of, I guess, the diversity of people involved um, in helping us, you know, solve this problem. It's multifaceted. Uh, we've got a variety of expertise in terms of those in our research team, um, but also those that are helping us in terms of in-kind support, whether or not it be access to samples from animals or potentially access to field trials. So it's been quite substantial, the work that we've been doing over the last three to four years to get us to this starting point. So in terms of the future of facial eczema research, um, if I was to summarise the, the seven-year program in terms of you know, its areas of focus, when we think about farmers, um, you know, one of our key aspects is to create awareness and understanding both for farmers and vets. Uh, we want to further investigate social and financial impacts. So that's getting a better handle and understanding of you know, what it really means in terms of the cost and also you know, the social consequences of this disease. And that leads directly into us thinking about, well, what is the best extension you know, to support adoption of new tools and solutions as we work forward? And a key part of that is um, the program will have a large uh, community of practice uh, directly involving um, quite a few farmers across New Zealand. In terms of the animals, you know, one of our goals is to see if we can identify early indicators of disease. We know that by the time that there's you know, liver damage, um, that that's probably too late. So can we use some new technology to you know, pick up the disease sooner rather than later? Um, we'll talk more about advancing methods to select tolerant animals for breeding. And from the environmental perspective, it's thinking about how can we detect the toxin um, in the environment? Um, what are some options there? Uh, what are the triggers, the, the triggers for producing um, the toxin? And also, you know, how can we look at optimal grazing strategies around pasture species? So I'm now going to hand over to Cara, who's going to take us through some of the achievements so far. Susie, and good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so I have the pleasure of telling you about some work we've had underway for the past few years as we, um, you know, developed the bigger program and awaited the funding decision. So next slide, please, Susie. Um, so one of the projects is learning more about the fungus itself. So um, as Susie said, and I'm sure you are aware that it is associated with a fungus um, that produces a toxin. And yeah, this project has been going on for a couple of years with Tina Boise at Ag Research and Bevan Weir at Landcare Research leading it. And it is really learning more about the fungus itself. So instead of looking just at the spores under the microscope where they all look the same, what can the DNA tell us? And it is pretty exciting that there are, you know, at least a couple of species that are found in the environment that are um, potentially associated with facial eczema and different abilities to produce the toxin. So, you know, those same species looking under the microscope will look identical, but if we look at the DNA and if we can develop a test to do that, then we may be able to provide more um, information to the farmer in terms of the risk. So have you got a toxic species in your environment or is it the safe species? And um, so John, who is here tonight and talk about the tolerance test, is helping us out with this to develop a research tool initially so that we can understand this better. 
And then if it is going to be useful for farmers, we could look at um, seeing if this could be a commercial test to actually identify risk of the fungus. Um, next one. Uh, so another piece of work, again, with Ag Research, um, Susan Valance and Martin Espeg, um, some social scientists, we looked into this um, social aspect of facial eczema, which Susie talked about before. So 14 farmers and vets um, were interviewed uh, from across the country. So those that experienced facial eczema often through to those that had never experienced it. And all of that information was um, collated and these four themes are what showed um, in those results. So not surprisingly, farmers really care for their animals. And this came through um, really strongly, particularly in those people who had experienced FE in their animals. Um, you know, the stories, as Susie said, they were, you could um, yeah feel the emotion coming through in the words. And even when I talk to farmers about um, their experience with FE, you can tell that it is very triggering. And um, they... I guess the concern about the fungus moving to different parts of New Zealand due to climate change, so due to that warming. Um, so that's not only moving further south, but also moving into different altitudes where it hasn't been before. So that was a big concern. Um, the hidden cost of FE, so if you've got that subclinical liver damage, but you're not seeing any signs, what is that doing to your bottom line? And ultimately, new solutions are needed for this very old problem and this pilot study the information there will be used in the larger program um, for how we can support um, farmers but also making sure that we're covering these aspects in the research as well next one and the sheep poo study so um yeah I think a lot of people on the call are involved in this um study which is great and just like to extend my thanks again for those participating in this season we have over 200 farmers involved and this study is to understand better where when and how facial eczema is occurring around New Zealand and um, we did a pilot study for this last FE season and the Farmer Reference Advisory Group really helped with us kind of refining um, what to sample um, and the questions to ask and this was done with ag research as well. So doing that piece of work and then being able to roll it out to a larger group of um, farmers this year was really important. So Every two weeks, farmers have been collecting samples of poo from one mob of sheep from October to May, and along with that, providing other information like aspect, the mob of grazing, um, the pasture um, type and height, the GPS location, the age and breed of the sheep, and um, if there's irrigation or not, the stocking density. So all of this information, which is a lot of information, and we've now got a really good data set just from year one, will be analysed to answer that question of um, where, when and how, how facial eczema is occurring. And this project is a three-year project because of that variability between seasons of facial eczema. We really need to do it more than one season. Um, so that is a very exciting piece of work and we will update further on that when we've done some analysis, um, which should be in the next couple of months. And... The last one, which we're all here to talk about, the facial eczema tolerance test for sheep. And um, I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce it and then hand over to Axel. So first of all, the need for the new test. And um, this was, you know, significantly driven by the breeders involved in the current test and, you know, pushing for the fact that there is a, you know, we need to do something different. So the current test is um, rams are challenged with the toxin and then rams that are tolerant are selected for breeding. So there are issues in terms of animal welfare implications with this of providing animals a toxin. The test isn't readily accepted by farmers. So, you know, I haven't met a farmer yet who likes this day on farm um, to the point where they won't um, necessarily want to be in the room. Um, there are potential consumer concerns with um, knowing this test occurs, even though it's for the betterment of the industry. And the other limiting factor is that only rams are tested, so it's, um, you know, not many animals. And, yeah, it just has a limitation in that perspective as well. So essentially, science has moved on from 
invasive animal testing and we need to look at doing something differently. Um, and this, the goal of the new test is obviously primarily having no harm to the animal. We need to make sure it accurately identifies those tolerant from susceptible animals and it needs to be reliable and affordable. So reliable meaning each time you do the test you get the same result and also if it's more affordable then more animals could be tested and obviously accelerating that breeding for FE tolerance. So that was a brief snapshot but I'll hand over now to Axel to delve into that a little bit deeper. Yeah thanks Cara. Um, kia ora, I'm Axel Heiser um, with Ag Research at the Hawker Research Institute in, in Palmas North and um, a few years ago now we've started thinking about what we could do to replace the test um, that is currently used, the REMGAR test, um, and that's in the upper half of the slide. Um, so spoiled jasmine is, is purified from a fungal culture and then rams are dosed with it. And three weeks later, a blood sample is taken and um, a molecule called GGT is measured in these samples. Um, and this molecule is released by the liver um, when the liver is damaged. Um, so if there is a low value after three weeks after the spiridesmin um, dosing, then this is considered to be a, a tolerant animal, a resistant animal, and it can be used for breeding. And the higher the GGT value, the more severe the damage to the liver is. Um, and these rams are excluded from for breeding, at least for breeding for, for the FE trait. So of course, this is not ideal to having to treat the animals with the toxin. And our idea was to um, take this out of the animal in, into, into the laboratory. And Beef and Lamb um, funded this work. Um, we put up a staged approach. Um, based on the idea that we can take some cells of the animal, um, ideally blood cells, um, and treat the cells with the sporidesmin. And then um, the cells will produce molecules to deal with the toxin, and we can measure these molecules and find out um, which signature of molecules or single molecule um, we can use to select the animals for breeding. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this was planned um, over several years so that we can develop the method and prove our hypothesis step by step. Um, next slide, in the first year, um, the goal was to, to get this test and the lab running. Um, next slide, we um, tried different numbers of cells and different concentrations of sporidesmin and different times of incubation. Um, and we tried to develop the test in a way that about half of the cells are killed within uh, the, the time frame of the test. Um, and then next slide, please. Uh, we took samples from these assays and we wanted to measure all the molecules that are released, um, the metabolites, the proteins, the RNA, the microRNA. Um, so the assay needed to work in a way that this was possible. Um, and next slide, please, that we got this to work. Um, so in the next year, we could apply this assay um, with samples from animals um, that we selected based on their susceptibility or tolerance to um, the Remga test. And there's a big, big thank you to all the farmers that helped us that year um, and provided samples. We had... Um, we looked at the GGT values after the Remgard dosing, and we had 80 tolerant animals, 60 susceptible animals. And then from a South Island um, farm, we had 60 animals that we called naive. Um, they were never selected for tolerance. They were never exposed to sporidesmin, and we just wanted them as a control group. We did our assay. Um, blood samples were shipped um, to Palmas North. We did our assay, and we sent um, the samples in for analysis of all these molecules. And the next slide, please. Um, so you can see in the top row that we got thousands of markers and literally terabytes of data back. 
um, and then we looked very closely at the correlation to the to the GTT values, and we ended up with a number of markers that we thought could work to predict the tolerance and 15 metabolites, seven proteins, 14 um, mRNA molecules, and 17 microRNA molecules. Um, next slide, please. So the next year, the next season, we wanted to confirm these markers with methods that are a bit more quantitative than what we had done before. And next slide, please. Again, we had um, a lot of help from the Remgard breeders um, to provide us with samples. And we that year we had 190 each susceptible and tolerant animals that we um, processed through the test. And we compared, um, we looked at our candidate biomarkers. Next slide, please. So in regard to the metabolites, um, we had problems finding good assays to detect these. We had one assay for one of the markers, but um, it didn't really give us the results we wanted. We developed a PCR test, um, a molecular detection method called a microRNA, um, um, detected 11 out of the 17, but despite seeing a difference in the previous year on a smaller group of animals and this larger group of animals, we could not um, see this difference between the susceptible and tolerant animals. There's a slight chance that there was a, uh, the, the PCR that we used was not um, uh, totally suitable for this. So we could go back and, and look at that. But most importantly, when we looked at the mRNA molecules, we saw four markers of, of promise. Um, next slide, please. So mRNA is the molecule that uh, when the body makes a protein sits between the DNA and the protein. Um, so if you detect the mRNA, then there's a pretty good chance that this cell of this body produces the protein as well. And the advantage is that the detection of the mRNA is a lot simpler and easier, especially in species that are not laboratory animals or humans um, to use. So using this, this detection of mRNA, we found these four uh, molecules, um, ACP7, CCL27, TLRX, and TXN2. And each graph shows you um, the number of dots. Each dot is one animal or the results from one animal. Um, and it's always on the left side is the samples from the susceptible animals on, on the right side, um, the tolerant animals. And as you can see, for all four markers, there is a significant difference um, between the susceptible and the tolerant animals. Um, theoretically, you can design a cutoff. Um, that's the red dotted line. Um, but you can also see that the separation is not not complete, not 100%. So there's tolerant animals that fall into on the other side of the test and the same for susceptible, which is a problem we are facing. Next slide, please. Um, so we are, the test is not 100%. We think that we may be in the range of about 80% um, of the animals that we can detect, but that would require a larger number of animals. We also tried, and that's the graph on the left side, to combine markers and see if we can improve on, on the separation and there may be something to it. Um, so that's why we want to do the next stage. The next slide, please. Um, and that is to take this um, rather expensive test that we are currently doing to measure these molecules and simplify it um, by using a so-called PCR test. And I think that's the point when I hand over to John McKay from Denature, who came to help us to develop this PCR test. John, over to you. Thanks, Axel, and evening, everybody. So what this uh, slide is showing here, again, um, having received samples and having him seen, seen him join the call, I'd just like to publicly acknowledge the great help um, of Neville Hack with this um, with this work, um, working with Axel. So we received a lot of um, RNA samples that have been processed through this toxicity assay. And 
are looking to uh, develop uh, a specific PCR test for the gene markers that uh, Axel and Neville have identified uh, via the nanostream. So using real-time PCR. And the benefits of real-time PCR is that it's used for uh, a number of uh, industries currently, for things like the apiculture industry. It's used currently for things like mycoplasma bovis um, or bovine TB. So it's a very accessible technology for uh, your diagnostic laboratories. All of them will have a, a real-time PCR machine. Uh, as, as Axel alluded to there, there is some overlap in the markers. So the, the cutoffs are not 100%. And so we, Ag Research, Beef and Lamb, and ourselves wondered whether using an amplification of PCR would help uh, tease out those differences. And I'll explain a little more in the next slide. So what we're trying to do, we're, we're doing a wee bit of a, um, we're, we're trying to do a bit of a Hail Mary test here, if you like. And by that, I mean, we're trying to put everything into a single test. We're trying to put the, the amplifications for the two candidate biomarkers that Axel and Neville have um, have identified, shown there is ACP, uh, ACP7 and CCL27, that's just the name of the genes. We're trying to put those two markers uh, into the test, into a single test, along with the reference genes, which is the bottom square. And the reference genes, if you like, are the normalizers. They correct for the amount of RNA going into the test. Because what we're trying to do is see the differences. Uh, each of those lines there on those left-hand graphs, each of those lines is a single, uh, is a single sample. But those three screens are in a single test. They're all in one tube, and those three screens are being looked at on different fluorescent wavelengths, different channels, if you like. But it's all happening simultaneously in the one test. And the reason why we're doing this, why we're trying to put it into one into the one test, Susie. Next slide, please. The reason why we're trying to do that is because it'll be easier for diagnostic laboratories to process because there's less pipetting. In other words, it's all going into the one test. It should be more sensitive to the gene cha changes rather than doing each of those markers in individual tests. Um, it will be faster as well, which all comes up with it will be a cheaper test. But and yeah, I'm sorry, there's always the, the but in these things, is putting everything into that one test means it is more difficult to design so that everything works nicely together. It's more difficult to design and get running. But so far, some of the novel things that we're trying in the development of this test, um, that's Ag Research and ourselves, the, the novel things we're trying are, are, are showing promise. So we're we're progressing it's a bit like you know if you if you shoot for the stars you might just end up on the moon if we can't get everything in the one test we can at least break it apart and look at doing some of these things individually a bit like axel showed with uh combining the markers uh with the previous technology so there's there's different ways that we can um cut the cake if you like but at the moment, we're trying to do it into that one test uh, to make it more accessible, uh, one for laboratories, which means it should flow into being a cheaper test. So next slide. And I think it goes back to you, Axel. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, so if, if we get this, if John gets this to work, um, then the, the, the hopefully last phase will be to take this relatively simple high throughput and low cost test and um, compare it, run it against the, the standard Ramgar test. Next slide, please. Um, and that means we will do what we have done in the past for the for the development of the test on a large number of, 
of RAMs where we, we take the blood sample after the um, RAM gut tests and we look at the GTT levels, but we also do our tests, do the PCR detection, and then compare the two. Um, and we look at how well they correlate, how many faults tolerant and fault susceptible we get in each test, and then have a discussion with our breeders um, to see if our new test lives up to, to the RAMGAR test. And if it does, then it can be um, put out to um, commercial testing labs and be available um, for the industry to be used. And I think it goes back to Susie. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Axel. But I will stop sharing my screen now. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight as to, I guess, all the various steps um, that the team has been working through. It certainly hasn't been straightforward. There's been some really challenging sites, um, but we're definitely making progress, but we're also keeping our options open as well um, in terms of that we do have things that we can go you know, back to and relook at differently, but also just in the context of the wider program, you know, we know that it's not going to be a silver bullet um, to fix fa facial eczema. We need to keep our options open and think about, you know, how else we can tackle it um, from a whole farm systems approach. Um, so now if everybody is happy, we can move on to um, some Q&A. So I will just go to my Q&A tab and hopefully that will pop up for me. One moment while I sort by technology. There's just one question in the Q&A at the moment. I want to see if there's any in the chat. Am I missing? Everyone wants to ask it in person, I think. Excellent. Pardon? I think everyone wants to ask their questions in person to you. That's fine. We can go that option. There is a question for Axel there. From Warwick, can you see that one? Is that in the chat or the Q&A section? Chat. Warwick, would you just like to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> Probably faster. Thank you, Susie. Um, Axel, I just remember a comment you made at in New Plymouth, the annual meeting, how it annoyed you as an immunologist to that the, the, the ultimate solution is going to probably come from the foragers, that there were going to be tools and solutions within within the animals and within the flock. But ultimately, we had some, I guess, questions to ask and solutions to find in the foragers. And it's a wider discussion than tonight. And perhaps it's, um, perhaps it's some highlights you can give us at this stage of your or anybody else in the team as to where, where that um, direction of travel is going. I, I I think there will clearly not be a silver bullet in the short or mid term. For that. it's 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 a it's a too multifaceted problem. Um, I, as an animal person, scientist, I love to have a, an animal solution, but that is the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Um, and the problem comes from outside the animal. Um, nevertheless, I think if we really want to beat this, then we need several solutions for it and providing the genetics and providing tools to, to breed um it's a good way forward genetics is always a good a good driver so if we can take the animal welfare issues out of out of that process and develop this test that then can be used not just on the rams but also on the use if we make it cheap enough then we can really make some some good gains on the on the breeding side I think probably the other thing to add to that work is, you know, all the different components of, you know, the program that we have are going to think about 
you know, how it all gets integrated into farm systems. So, you know, some of the other new work that Bevan Weir is about to start, which is understanding the environmental triggers for toxin production. A component of that is then also thinking, well, are the assumptions that we've always sort of recognised around that this fungus likes warm, moist environments, how true does that hold? You know, what is the role of, I guess, you know, dead leaf matter um, in terms of forages as well? And, you know, another piece of work um, that we've had done was done by Derek Moot and his team doing, you know, a, basically a literature search to see, you know, how we could sort of get quite clear in our minds, you know, what had been done in terms of your know, forage trials and evaluating all the information that circulates around your know, ryegrass being considered a high risk pasture. You know, is there work that we need to do to test that theory? Um, or is all of the information and expertise you know, that farmers have provided us with you know, help us then inform what those other, I guess, you know, things that we could be evaluating in terms of different combinations of forage. But I think whatever we come up with, it's going to be about, well, how do we actually prepare a farm system from a number of different perspectives and whether or not that's preparing our, our animals and understanding what does surveillance look like for this disease, but also then thinking, well, how can we you know, optimise our farm systems to try and minimise the risk in terms of, I guess, you know, supporting the optimal environment that triggers you know, the um, production of the toxin. Yeah. Anybody else in the team like to comment or anybody else have further thoughts? Yeah, I wouldn't mind a, a word. My name's Tom. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Go ahead, Tom. Um, ryegrass, ryegrass uh, and eczema. I think there's a strong correlation between ryegrass and eczema. And the better you do your pasture preparation, the higher chance you seem to get eczema. And so, Tom, is that something that you've observed both on hills and flat country? Yeah. Yeah. And have you it's, noticed any have, have you noticed any changes if you've introduced different forage species? I've tried all sorts. Um, ryegrass staggers was a problem once a time, on a time, but the droughts killed the ryegrass, so it's taken a while for that to come back. Um, that facial eczema. The better job you do, um, and you've got a, unless you take it down to a residual of sort of eight, nine hundred for the sun to get in, if you hang it around two thousand, you tend to get eczema more. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got shared similar experiences to Tom? <laughs> Well, if anybody wants to yeah, follow up with us afterwards, that would be great. But certainly, Tom, yeah, we support um, yeah, that narrative in that yeah, we often have conversations with farmers in Northland that say now that because well, ryegrass has failed for them, they're no yeah. longer having you know such issues um, with facial eczema anymore. So it's certainly something to be conscious of um, yeah, moving forward in terms of your know, dominant ryegrass pastures and what that means from a risk perspective. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think residuals seem to affect eczema too. 800 sounds excessive, but um, the sun seems to kill the eczema because it's dirt the next bit, isn't it? Mm. Anybody got any other comments on that before I move on to a couple of other questions? Well, the, the counter to that would be um, deferred grazing, the, the work that's been done um, my brain's not going to quickly retrieve the, the lady from Ag Research in the Waikato. Uh, Catherine Tozer? Yes, Catherine. Um, you know, the, the spore counts out of the, the food grazing were, were lower than the... Um, so, you know, it's, is it, it, does that mean it's at either end of the... I think so. I think you're exactly right. I think you choose one or the other, and middle ground's dangerous. You there? Any other thoughts, Ross? Uh, well, yeah. Um, my understanding is not just ryegrass that's that's you know, a high risk species. You got brown top and and other things. So it's not nothing about eczema is cut and dry. No. 
It's certainly not straightforward, but hopefully with the bigger program and, you know, thinking about tackling it from different perspectives, well, you know, hopefully fill in some of the current knowledge gaps that we've got. Um, just looking at the chat, there's a question around whether or not the test that's being developed will be applicable to sheep also in the South Island that have not been exposed to facial eczema. Any thoughts on that one, Axel? Yeah, so that's the that's advantage of the test is that we, we it doesn't matter. Um, it is the, the test is just testing the ability of, of, of the animal um, to deal with the toxin and that, that you can do that um, with a very young animal, with an animal that has never seen sporodesmin, but also with, with animals that, that have been through a season or a few. We, we do not expect the test to change in performance um, depending on that. So it can be widely um, applied. We will have to do the science to confirm that, but biologically, it should not be a difference. And Axel, what are your thoughts on, I guess, testing, you know, um, with different breeds of sheep? Is that something that we'll need to factor in moving forward? I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, if the test... If the test works, then I would suspect that there is a genetic difference between these animals. Um, and that means we can look at different breeds and maybe help finding the genetic markers um, that to me would be the holy grail of a test. If we could do a genetic marker for selection, that would be a lot easier than doing this elaborate lab test and followed by PCR. But and the test may be able to help with that. But it could also be that the genetic difference is so multifaceted and involves so many genes that it, it'll be hard to find. And our, our test using the live cells has an advantage there because we are looking at, at a working model. Um, so that's, that's going to be interesting to see. And, um, we, I think we all suspect that different breeds have different abilities um, to deal with, with facial eczema. So it will be interesting to see if the test can shed some light on that. Mm -hmm. This might be another one for you, Axel, as well. Um, do you know what year um, we will start testing against animals um, currently in the RAMGAR program? Hopefully this year, isn't it? It's if, if, the, the starting point is is to have the PCR at a level that we can at least in the lab do it at, at high throughput. Um, and yeah, my hope would be that with the next season we can um, start something again and come back to all the wonderful breeders and veterinarians that helped us to, to get samples in the past two years. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's the goal. Um, we've still got you know, a few hurdles to, to overcome first before you know, we look to start collecting samples because we want to be fairly confident um, you know, that we've you know, <laughs> we've got something, uh, to be honest. Um, yeah, and so we'll start working through what that could look like because um, the other thing that we know people are interested in is, you know, what does this look like in terms of ultimately connecting with a breeding value? So that's a separate piece of work that we would need to do after we have, you know, hopefully validated this test for use and compared it against ram guard animals as well. But yeah, that is certainly the plan, Russell. Uh, next question is, what is the uh, inheritability of the resistant gene? Don't think we know that answer yet, do we, no. Axel? No, we no. don't even know the gene with this. With this, a few genes that our, our genomics team has has their, their their eyes on, but uh, we don't know yet, and the heritability is, is unknown, consequently. Thanks, are we sure uh, that, are we uh, sure that question doesn't, uh, sorry, are we sure that question doesn't just mean uh, what's the heritability of uh, the test that's been currently used? Like through cell, well, well, um, as a point, one, point four or point three or? We still don't know what the gene is, though, associated with that. Um, 
Fiona, do you are you able to clarify your question for me? No, but we might circle back to that one. Um, next question that I've got in front of me is, um, is there any research around the levels of FE challenge on multi-species pasture compared to traditional ryegrass and clover? I don't know, Cara, do you remember if there was anything in the literature review that Derek Moot did that highlighted anything along those lines for us? Well, it was mainly the research done on single species um, and some small research on multi-species, but not, um, not significant amounts, but I can come back to you and we can share um, what we've got on that or if anyone else on the call has any other knowledge about that. It's included just in the oh, sorry. sorry, Jenny, you go. Oh, no, you go, Dan. <laughs> I was just going to say it's included in the Whenua Halmanu project that um, Massey and MPI are running it as one of the things they're looking at across their different um, species in there, uh, different plots, sorry. And I think the other I thing that complicates things a little bit for us is looking retrospectively at some of the research that's been done because we now know that it was probably done on using, like, assessing more than one fungal species because with the um, research that Cara spoke around where we now know that there is a fungal species that produces the toxin and then there's a different species that doesn't produce the toxin but under the microscope they look the same so this is something that we need to be conscious of when we think about the research that's been done previously is potentially they were viewing it as a single species whereas now we know that it's more than one so it's just always something that we need to make sure we don't get tripped up on going forward Ginny, did you have a comment? Yeah, just a comment. I mean, we talk about ryegrass and clover pastures, but most of our hill country is all sorts of species and largely brown top and danthonia and all those other, you know, it's a, a real mix. And often you're lucky if you see a lot of ryegrass and, you know, working in the central North Island for the last sort of 10 years, um, you know, in that Western hill country, you still get really high spool counts, um, even though it's a diverse pasture. <laughs> um. Next question that I've got um, is, if this test is successful, will the things that we have learnt um, be useful to help develop the same for cattle? That one might be for you, Axel. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, I would think that we have a pretty good chance that the same markers that we found in sheep work in cattle. Um, they are similar enough and um, we actually have started to work with um, um, cattle breeders to collect some samples. And so we have them ready to, to put them through the test. And the same could probably apply to deer and alpaca and llama and other ruminants. Great, thanks, Axel. And probably just a follow up question from that one. In terms of, I guess, the starting material, can this PCR be done on a tissue sample? Um, or is it um, better suited for a serum sample? No, we serum doesn't help us. We need live cells um, to do the assay. It's a functional assay. The PCR at the end is just the, the second stage. So we need the live cells direct to the to the sporidesmin. Um, in the first year, we did some studies on saliva samples. Um, I, I work on the same floor at the Hockirk um, as Richard Shaw, who runs the color testing for us. Um, so we were thinking about using saliva samples, which are potentially a lot easier to take. Um, and they do include live cells if you don't freeze them. But the cell numbers we got out of the samples at the time were too low to do our, our um, bound market discovery work. Um, but if we get this test to work on the blood cells, I would like to go back and have a look at saliva samples. And another source could be ear punches um, if, if we get them into the lab with live cells in them. So there are a few alternatives that we could look at that do not require blood samples. Great, thanks Axel. And I've had a question come through posed for both um, you and John around, you know, what do you kind of think are the chances of what we're working on at the moment being successful and becoming a cost-effective alternative to RAMGUARD for breeders? 
if you had to put your money on it, would you? <laughs> Who's going to answer, Axel or John? Well, I guess I guess we are putting our money on it because we're still working on it. We haven't given up. Um, it is, I think, very much. It is pushing the limits. Uh, if you happen to see the y-axis on some of Axel's slides, that the number of copies of the gene, you know, one that there are small changes between susceptible and tolerant animals, but the absolute number of copies of the gene is very low as well. So it's a bit of a, a double whammy, but we do have other options. There are, you know, the team has had discussions around other um, you know, next steps if our current one um, isn't entirely successful. Um, so I always say, yeah, while, while we've still got ideas, we'll keep working on, you know, we keep going and we're still going. Right. Thanks, John. Um, so just looking at a few questions that have come through the Q&A and conscious that we really do want to wrap up at um, 7.30 so you can all um, put your feet up for the evening or have dinner or whatever you need to do. Uh, so we might not get through all of them, um, but we've got a question here around um, what's the time frame needed to replace the RAMGUARD test in order to generate breeding values? Would you, would you like that one, Axel? <laughs> I'm not an expert in breeding values, so we maybe we can call somebody else in, but I think we need... The number of animals that we that we need to confirm the value of our test um, compared to what the Ramgar test is doing, I would think that we are talking about one or two seasons with a lot of samples being provided by the breeders, which has never been a problem. The breeders have always been very, very supportive. So it's a matter of um, getting the logistics right. And then I I personally would think two seasons just to account for differences between seasons um, and, and between um, to have a few more animals um, and then have the confidence that, that we are really matching the results that we see from the Remgar test. How long it takes from there to turn it into a, a breeding value, I'm... I'm need somebody else to answer that. But I think it's also, it's the recognition that this isn't like a finite endpoint either. So it, you know, if the test is successful and we get it up and running and it's adopted it, you know, by breeders and different commercial laboratories, we're always going to have the opportunity to further refine it and keep testing it and learning and learning from it as well. So it doesn't end <laughs> at any point. Um, you know, diagnostic tests that would have been valid five or 10 years ago will have shifted on in terms of, you know, how, you know, I guess the types of equipment that are needed, you know, how fast, how efficient they are, how confident we are um, in the information that they provide us and how we can use that in decision making as well. So we're still, you know, very much in the, I guess, the progression and going through kind of a fairly rigorous stop go point because we, we want to be confident um, before we launch this and have this test up and running. And as Axel said, you know, we do need to test things over multiple seasons, um, but it is also about, you know, comparing it with the current test and seeing how the two line up or where they differ, where they differ. And also I think with the PCR, the way that we're looking at it, it's not going to be a straightforward yes or no answer. So that will be part of the work that we'll need to do as well, is to understanding how the information that we get from the PCR relates to level of tolerance because we have that opportunity at the moment with the RAMGUARD test because animals are exposed to different concentrations of the toxin. And so the opportunity for us with the DNA test is, well, what is the equivalent when we're trying to compare against um, you know, sporogesmin dosing? So still a bit of work to, to go, but it's definitely looking really promising. And it's been really exciting to, to see how it evolves and to think about how it could actually provide you know, a much better alternative to what we've got currently. So we've got five minutes to go. Um, is there any question that I have missed that really needed to be answered that somebody has seen that I've skipped? Because that's highly likely as I've been scrolling through everything that I may have missed one. Um, anybody else on the team notice that I've missed a question that was posed? Hello, it's Dave Reed here. Um, 
I'm wondering how you rank whole flock testing under natural challenge uh, of GGT testing. From what perspective, Dave? Like to compare? Oh well, you get a you get a high FE season. You mm -hmm. just bleed all your sheep and get a GGT level for every sheep. So as a way of selecting for. Yeah, getting rid to getting rid of susceptible animals. Uh, Axel, do you want to comment on that one or any of our other breeders online? That's this is Kate speaking. I mean, we we're currently doing that using that natural challenge if it's something that you know you're you're lucky enough to get um, as a breeder. I embrace high spore counts. So, you know, when we've got the high counts, you bleed everything and then take that bottom off. So, and, and it, it can be um, put into sill to create the breeding value if you have a, a big enough um, curve. So we are doing that now. Yeah, Kate, I was just wondering if any of the experts would like to comment on how they see the efficacy of that compared with a RAM oh. guard or, or a DNA test. Right, gotcha. Dan? I, I think to be fair to these guys, Dave, they're not geneticists. I think you're asking a genetics question there, aren't you? Oh, okay, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I mean if you if you if you want to select then any 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 way to to get a feel of susceptibility and tolerance will help you with the selection, but if you have to rely on natural exposure, then then it becomes becomes tricky. I would certainly love to do um, to use our tests on a flock that has been naturally exposed and see if the test gives the re same results on the naturally exposed animals as on the on the Remga tested animals. So these are things we could do in the future to further confirm the tests. Um, yeah, but I think our initial starting point is yeah comparing it with things that where we can control some of the variables and natural challenge probably creates a bit too much uncertainty, but it's certainly something for us to be aware of in terms of how we validate the test and understand you know are we dealing with you know flocks that have been exposed or not exposed and how we then interpret that information moving forward. All right, so we're at 728 team. Um, if everybody is happy, we'll wrap it up there. Um, on behalf of FIFA Lamb. Huge thanks um, for joining us and spending the last hour with us. Really appreciate it. Um, if anything pops up and you've thought of a question, um, perhaps sometime tomorrow, by all means, get in touch and we'll do our best to answer it for you. Um, but on that note, uh, thank you very much and have a good evening.